Before we get started with today's show, be sure to check out ESPN Daily. Our podcast is putting out an episode every single weekday, rain or shine. Some good episodes this week were Wright Thompson on his big Michael Jordan story and Paul Feinbaum on the ramifications of a single conference in college football, such as the Pac-12 deciding they need to cancel their season. Subscribe to ESPN Daily in the right time wherever you get your podcast. Also, we'll be closing out the Jordan Rules with author Sam Smith here shortly, but we hope you enjoyed The Last Dance, a behind-the-scenes look at the final championship of the Chicago Bulls dynasty. If you missed it when it aired, all 10 episodes are up at ESPN+. Plus. And then listen to the wrap-up podcast from Jalen and Jacoby. Our coverage of The Last Dance is brought to you by State Farm. When you want the real deal, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Coverage is also brought to you by AT&T. The Jalen and Jacoby After Show continues this Sunday following Lance, part one of a two-part ESPN 30 for 30 film on Lance Armstrong's rise and fall in the sports world. Hear from Armstrong himself in a film that insists the audience make its own interpretation of one of the biggest doping scandals in history. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening wherever you get your podcast. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are, in fact, a hater. Coming up on this episode, we are wrapping up the Right Time Book Club. The book was The Jordan Rules. The author, Sam Smith, will join us. And yeah, we'll ask him about Horace Grant going off on Michael Jordan. But first... All right, so we have kind of stayed away for Rona talk, I feel like in the last couple of weeks or so, like Michael Jordan has put us in a place where we haven't had to go so Rona heavy on our topicality. They come to sports to get away from their real lives. At least that's what they say. Anyway, we got to get back in this Rona for just a little bit, though, because one thing that's going on with the Rona, like I don't, I don't want to say this to make light of nobody, but look, times are hard, man. People struggling right now. People trying to figure out how they're going to make it, all kinds of strategies they're coming up with behind that. Um, and there have been stories for a long time about, I think, something like two-thirds of Americans live check to check or something like that, have less than a thousand dollars in savings. But what you have also come to learn is that a few of these businesses and these rich people were also live in check to check. The checks were bigger, but they live in checks to check. And in fact, we need to start looking at some of these owners the same way we look at these ball players. If you're talking about these ball players and uh, how they can't survive a lockout because they're not getting some checks, COVID is like the lockout of the world. And we haven't heard out loud about that many owners whose money is looking a little funny right now, but there is one owner whose money is looking funny, and that is Tillman Fertitta. Now, Tillman Fertitta is the owner of the Houston Rockets, and without any shade to Fertitta, he got all his money in the wrong places, man. His money in restaurants, his money's in casinos, he owns um, a couple of amusement parks, He's based in Houston, and the oil sector is taking a bath right now. So that's doing bad things to you know to Houston as it goes. It's just not a great time to be Tillman Fertitta. And all of this comes after that one thing that happened. Y'all may have remembered when Daryl Morey sent that tweet out about Hong Kong. And then, you know, the Chinese, they don't really have a sense of humor about that thing, right? And so it, it messed up his money. I mean, it didn't mess up. It really messed up the NBA's money. He messed up the money there, and now the virus is hit, and this ain't just messing up his NBA money. That's messing up all his money. Gabe, I don't know if you saw this story where he borrowed something like $290 million at 13%. That is like putting $290 million on a credit card, like an actual credit card. Yeah, I was going to say, because it would be important to kind of clarify for people like interest rates. Think about this. It's higher than the interest rate on your car note, right? Like if you go in there, they 13% on the car note. This is for $290 million. And they gave him an interest rate at 13% at a time, by the way, where generally speaking, money is free, right? Like the interest rates are low, 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 low. They loaned that money to Fertitta like it's 1978. That's how funny his money looking right now. He need these checks, right? So the restaurant guild, I don't know what the, the whole, the, the restauranteers organization, I don't know what they call themselves, but they all went up to DC to meet with Trump because all these restaurant folks are hurting right now, right? Like some of it is just like the mom and pop folks that's around. You're like, damn, I'd hate it if Geno's went out of business or something like that, right? But the big super restaurant money, they're like, yo, we need to go talk to this man. 
So anyway, they go up there to D.C. They go to the White House to meet with Trump, and they all sitting around at this big old like conference room, six feet, like social distancing, all of that stuff. They in there with Trump. And for Tita, because he owns a very large restaurant chain, he's up there, and this man going through it. It's been devastating, and it's you know it's funny you brought up about China. I should have realized it was going to be a bad year for China when my general manager tweeted out. <laughs> so <laughs> that started my my and year with China. Quiet, right? and you kept that quiet. Quiet. So uh, so I'm still <laughs> trying to work well, that. Press out. pause. Press pause. Press pause. Trump said they kept that quiet. No, he did not keep it quiet at all, sir. <laughs> and here comes something he else. He owns the Houston Rockets, in case you didn't know. <laughs> and but, he's a great, and by the way, he's a great guy, great family, great everything. And uh, yeah, he did uh, cause you a little ruckus. Did, whatever <laughs> happened to him, by yes, the way? Is he yes. still working for you? Yes, he is. He must be pretty good. Yes, because uh, <laughs> it's just uh, it's a trick question, <laughs> but he is. So, so, but, 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 Mr. President, it's a trick question. Dave, you know, it's a trick question. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yo, Daryl Morey, and I don't know what it's like to be Daryl Morey at this point. Here's what I do know. I do think Fertitta is, like, legitimately conflicted because he thinks Morey is the best general manager working. Like, he really thinks he's good. Like, when Trump was like, he must be good at his job, he's like, yeah, 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 I think he's good at his job, but they also had won no championship, and the team looked good but not great in the course of this year, right? But Morey just needs everybody to forget that ever happened. Right. Like that's what he needs. I just need everybody to forget that ever happens. And for Tita probably swears to him never happened. Right. It never comes up at the office. Nobody talks about it around Daryl. All of that stuff. Right. Nope. Tillman thinks about this every single day. Well, what I like, too, is in the subsequent clip that we didn't play because we put, just played the short one here. And he breaks down for Trump how the collective bargaining agreement works for the NBA and how the mm-hmm. players get 50% of the chair. No other league works this way. I can assure <laughs> you of that. <laughs> Tillman, so maybe you bought the wrong team then. <laughs> All right, like, what do you mean? To, wow, man. But, yo, for Tina, he's got to be bricks every single day ain't nobody trying to reopen quite like Tilbert Fertitta they tell Fertitta they talk about yeah we want to come back with no fans he's like what you mean with no fans get those people in here they ain't gonna die and if they die we'll get more people in here they ain't the only people that want to watch a basketball game whatever let's go like this is like everybody's trying to get out here like we're seeing the whole messaging everywhere like governors like the governor of California his stuff is talking differently he's talking about there'll be pro sports in California in June you know, like it seems like everybody, what everybody's talking about seems to be flipping more and more and more toward we got to get this money. We got to get this money and they do got to get this money. Like I am not. I One thing I cannot be in this is the guy that looks at ownership and believes that everybody is simply being craven by trying to get out there. Bills are due. Nothing, nothing else about the world has stopped. Right. I get it. They here to get money. There are people there who are in their offices. What do you get paid to do? I get paid to get money. Well, if you're not out here getting money, what are you, what am I paying you to do? So what are they going to do? They go sit up there every waking moment trying to figure out a way to get this money. I can't imagine how many times in these league offices and these team offices, somebody just runs into a room and goes, well, not a room because nobody's in it. But how many times somebody says something on Slack like, I got it. Right? Like everybody's just trying to come up with the, I got it. It's kind of like when you can't find it, but you're trying to think who got it. I got it. Right? Like it's just anybody, anyone, anywhere, any of it that you could possibly conceive of. That is where they are. It's Tilbert Fertitas at the front of the list. What's that? And you're talking about like figuring out ways to get this money, but it's also that the owners are trying to figure out a way to not have to pay this money. Right. And then you have folks like Blake Snell, when you talked about on the podcast last week, trying to figure out a way to not play, but still get this money. Yes, yes, yes. Whirlpool of I'm not playing until you do this. I'm not paying you until you do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just what it's got to be. That's what it's got to be. But what you're going to learn is every time we say that the players can't survive a lockout or players can't survive a strike, we're going to find out just how much these owners actually can withstand. Right. We're going to see how hard they like how close they can hang, where exactly they can go with it, what they can do. 
I just know that one man would like us to get back out here playing basketball as soon as possible. I'm trying to think about who else might be out here and their money doesn't like actually exist. Like, like how are we, we're going to have to start doing like little tests when people like we, we get a, a, a press conference up for one of those owners and he starts talking with his hands a lot and the story kind of goes, well, yeah, so we need to get the money because yeah, well, no, no, our money was good. Everything was straight. But then, you know, what happened was the virus came up and then that went down. And then I went and talked to somebody else and they said, I owed them a little bit of money. I'm like, I already paid you that money. But they're like, yo, you got to get them a little bit of money. But it's cool because after the virus comes, I'm going to get this big check in from the league. We're going to get the TV money check. Right. Then we're going to be coming back. Okay, I'm good for it. I'm going to pay you back. Right. Like as soon as we start hearing all oh, I have to do something that involves Sam, yo, I'm good for it. That's how you know shenanigans are in place. Shenanigans are on the way. The whole thing with owners and how much like money they actually have is just so interesting because I feel like it just has like a layman as like a fan. You look at all owners the same way. You look at them all as these kind of like super rich type guys, big moguls. But like when we were reading the Jordan rules and they talked about Reinsdorf and how he got the bulls and how much like money he actually had to put up. Yeah. How much money they're taking loans out yes. to be able to make that work. Yep. You're not actually that rich. Well, Reinsdorf, you know, Reinsdorf doesn't even own 50% of that team. Michael Jordan's worth more money than Reinsdorf is. Yeah. Reinsdorf is one of the very few owners, ain't that many of them, in professional sports where there's a black person richer than them. Right? Like, a few of them are stitching this together. You, uh, you're you a Dodgers fan, right? Your man, McCourt. McCourt bought the Dodgers with no money. He bought it with paper. Like, there was a whole run where these guys were buying teams and all they had was paper. So, McCourt bought the Dodgers with no money, sold it for a billion dollars, right? He walked in with no cash, got back a billion dollars, and got to keep the parking lots. That part of the deal is crucial, and not a lot of people know about it. Got to keep the parking lots. You got parking in L.A.? Yep. Cha-ching. Yeah, but it was the parking lots at Dodger Stadium, right? So, like, he's still getting all the, he was still getting all the money, but he didn't have the money. A lot of these guys have a lot of money. A lot of them are like, you know, you get those that are like inheritors of big cash or whatever it is. Um, but like the Packers, I saw something that said, I forget how many millions of dollars in cash the Packers have because the Packers aren't owned by anybody, right? They're, they're a corporation. Hey man, some of these folks ain't actually got this money and they really need to get out here and play these games. Like, especially in baseball, they need to get out here and play these games. What is it about Tillman Fertitta that brings it all home for you? Because <laughs> it's always him. It's always him. Whenever there's something about owners screwing up. Because he always is the one that's doing something. Like in this case, he didn't actually screw up. It's a virus. It's a pandemic. He's just in the worst place to be if you got a pandemic that's going on. Like I got nothing in particular against Fertitta in the course of this discussion. He's just real wrong place, wrong time. If Daryl, like you said, Daryl Morey would have messed up the money. And I've looked, man, Daryl Morey messed up the money. When it's all said and done, let's find out for this NBA season, who did more damage to the money, Daryl Morey or COVID-19? I'm telling you, that's a real question. I've talked a little bit to people about this. It's a real question. Yeah. So that's where we are. Your COVID update. Which one of y'all would Phil Tillman for Tita ask for some money first, right? Like, you know, Houston opened it back up, right? You, if you go eat dinner with Fertitta, you better do it at a uh, Fertitta-based chain because if it ain't a place he owns, he ain't picking up the check right now. Y'all used to me paying. Not no more. It's a pandemic. All right, it is the Right Time Book Club. We are wrapping up now with our final episode. Uh, the first episode, we had J.A. Adande join us. We had Vinny Goodwill next of Yahoo Sports. We had Joe Dumars. We had B.J. Armstrong. And now, as we've done in previous years with the book club, we are concluding with the author of the book. He worked with the Chicago Tribune for many years covering the Chicago Bulls. He now works for ChicagoBulls.com. His name is Sam Smith. Sam, I appreciate you joining us. I'm only good to talk to you. That's an impressive group you had there. I, I actually think you'd, you'd have enough right there. No, <laughs> no, we had, DJ, that's, yeah, uh, that's I, the best of Detroit. Yeah, no, that was actually, we actually got some help from somebody who was like, why are all these people from Detroit on here? <laughs> and I didn't realize it until after. It was like, yeah, you know what? This is actually a lot of Detroit. It was not on purpose. It just got kind of to worked out that way. Uh, 
But with the book itself, I read it, I was telling you before we got started, I read it when I was young, and then I read it again in adulthood, and I guess this is probably my third time through it, and this one I got the Kindle edition, and it had a lot of your thoughts going back, you know, looking at the book, you know, with the benefit of hindsight. And one thing I did think was interesting in what you wrote in their foreword, and as I read the book again, is it's interesting to think of how controversial it was because it doesn't really read that controversially now, according to our standards and sensibilities. It is. I know that's the interesting thing. People will say to me, um, and this was 30 years ago, people will say to me in recent years, exactly what you said. Not only what was it so controversial, because I would say, well, you know, I was kind of under siege and I was hiding in my basement and I couldn't come <laughs> out. And they say, well, what, what were people upset about? And obviously times change, things judge in different eras, like we always try to judge, you know, Wilt versus, uh, you know, Shaq or, you know, Oscar versus uh, LeBron, whatever the case might be. And, you know, different circumstances, different times, you know, but then it, it, part of it was, and, you know, my message always was the thing is I like Michael. I, I always liked Michael and I enjoyed him, you know, in the documentary. And, and to me, the best part of documentary has been us seeing him the way he, we saw him kind of in the eighties, challenging, open, you know, funny, a humanity thing. And, and, but, and I think we saw the thing with his mother, which was interesting, where she kind of pushed him out to go, you know, go to Nike, wasn't even sure he wanted to go. And to me, you know, that, that was the indication that, that of who Michael was then. He really wasn't chasing all this money and all this, you know, marketing fame and whatever the riches, whatever the case was. He was just wanted to play basketball and this group around him hooked up these fabulous marketing plans and deals, Spike Lee and the commercials. And Michael just went along. You know, mom said, do it. So he's doing it. As a result, he was set up through marketing, you know, a separate independent from life. You know, marketing, advertising sells you an image of what not exactly or what you want to buy or what you want to be kind of sells a myth. And so they're selling this myth of Michael Jordan, perfect human being. Coca-Cola commercial where he flew up into the treehouse and, you know, in the sneakers and everybody skipping along, be like Mike. And they say, well, this is like the perfect guy. And he was a good guy. But my message was more like Barkley, who was given the message in the late 80s, like, hey, you know, we're not your role models. You, you know, have your family, you know, raise you. We're not here to raise you. We're sort of regular guys with positives and negatives. And, you know, we're not felons or anything. But, you know, don't look to us to raise your children. But the notion in the advertising sort of was that, hey, you can look to Michael because he's perfect. And the element in writing the book, just doing a diary is, of, you know, some days are better than other days. And some days you're going to seem like a jerk and some days not. But the message through it, and I, and I, and I felt like I was writing it at the time because I understood that this was what Michael felt he needed to do as a leader to kind of drag these guys along. The point is kind of got overlooked a little bit to me in the documentary was they essentially rebuilt the team under Jordan while he was there. He comes in, there were veterans and high draft picks and Jerry Krause they got criticized for it a lot, but, but it, it really was the right, it worked out. Obviously he got rid of, you know, all these guys, what sort of the Sixers did a few years ago for future draft picks. So Michael in the middle, he's trying to compete with bird and magic and, and under him, you know, they're taking out the scaffold and, you know, removing the foundation and so by the time these guys come along, Scotty and Horace in the late 80s, he's pretty frustrated trying to win. And so now he's sort of a veteran guy trying to herd these cats along. You know, to do so, it's, you know, it's it, it's not always a gentle uh, tap in the rear. You know, it's it's interesting to think that the controversy as when it first came out, I mean, we're well beyond ball four at that point. So it's not like getting a behind the scenes look at a team with something that people weren't familiar with. But it was very particular to the fact that it was about this guy, right, that it was about the guy that had been built up in that way. And I think one of I guess one of the things that's become a big story now with the documentary, but it's also kind of a running theme in the book is that. Michael could occasionally be hard on the guys who were around him. The thing that would be difficult for me to tell is how much of that came with the wink and how much of that was just being mean, right? And I think the documentary didn't even necessarily do the best job of clearing that up. Yeah, no, that, that's, you're right. That's, that's a good point. And, and a lot of it was with a wink to me. A lot of times when we write, or we talk, people go, well, you took that out of context. And I think that was a lot of the controversy. Like I wrote this scene about Michael on, on the airplane telling the stewardess, you know, it's kind of got played up again, not, you know, not, not to let Horace have food because, you know, he played badly. And, and it was, you know, it was sort of, you know, kind of locker room fraternity joking kind of stuff back and forth. It wasn't like, you know, he didn't get up and, 
and announce over the loudspeaker. Although Michael might have done something like that, <laughs> you know, is about you know try to humiliate. But it, it, it was it was sort of Michael's way of challenging. You know, I told somebody sort of the not that it was about me, but it was like sort of. Like 30 years later, Michael is kind of copping to all this. You know, for all these years, he was saying, well, you know, that's not right. I didn't say this, you know. And now he says, well, yeah, of course, that's about when that's what winning's about. And, and we go, well, yeah, that's right. That's right, because it worked. A lot of it was Michael's personality, which, you know, I felt like I explained all the way through the book. But and then I think that's why it was controversial in part at the time, because these little, you know, quotes would be pulled out, you know, and there'd be a headline and we go into the city and it would say, you know, Michael Jordan took away Horace's food. <laughs> so, I mean, Horace could afford to buy his own food too. <laughs> but, but yeah, so some of it was what we see in in a lot of these episodes. They showed it, you know, in the documentary where Michael is joking back and forth, and with uh, you know whether it be Randy Brown or Jerry Krause, you know, Jerry get you know you can see a lot of that is joking stuff. But it depends on how you take it. You know, it comes off as mean spirited. And that, you know, with Mike, it was always kind of a competition, you know, uh, stand up to me. And, you know, what, well, I guess what came involved to be called trash talking. Now, I wonder for you with the book in the process of writing it, how early on was it that you realized that this was going to be a big deal, right? Like not just a project that you were working on, but that this was going to be something that was really going to make waves. Never. <laughs> really. <laughs> when it came out, I still didn't think it was going to be a big deal. As I look back on it, I was probably naive. Uh, but all the messages of the book were that this is no big deal. I had never written a book before. And I really was kind of doing it. I'm traveling with the team. I've been the regular beat writer for several years. Before that, I was, I, but I was doing NBA work too overall. I, I had been down. I got to know Phil Jackson. I did a uh, CBA magazine story for the Tribune on a Sunday magazine then. I spent time in Albany back in the early 80s. After I switched over from, uh, I was a government and national reporter for the Tribune when I came and switched to sports in the early eighties. And then the week Jordan came in 84, I had gone out to do the, you know, the boilerplate, uh, rookies in town. What's he like? You know, feature story. So I've been around that team a long time. And, and so now, you know, I'm traveling with them and I thought, you know, it would just be like fun, interesting to see if I could write a book, you know, sort of like a challenge. And I, w- I was thrilled to have the opportunity to doing what I was doing. Covering the team was great fun. I enjoyed it. Uh, I wasn't looking for a different job or something else. But I thought, hey, someday it'd be nice to look on a shelf and say, hey, I wrote a book and did something like that. And I'd met people now who had written books and said, well, you know, they're not so smart. I can do that, too. <laughs> and so I decided to do it. So I go out and. um there was a publisher, a small publisher in Chicago, literally an office across from the Tribune. I just go there myself. I didn't have an agent or anyone. I, I wrote a proposal and I gave it to the guy and he said, you know, this is really good. I like it. I could give you $4,000 as an advance. And I said, well, I need $6,000 because I need to buy a new computer and I need babysitting money for my son. <laughs> so, so. I come back to the Tribune and I was telling somebody this and a friend of mine, Dan Pearson, who had uh, written some books, covered the bears, said, I got a friend who's an agent. And so sent a proposal to her and she said, yeah, I like this, Sherry Wink. And she said, try to sell it. And so, but she's, she's having trouble. She can't sell it. I get about 10, about nine or 10 uh, rejection letters from all New York publishers saying, well, who are you? You know, first time author. We never heard of you. Hey, Michael Jordan, we know who he is, but he doesn't win anything. You know, that's a losing team. And so she finally makes a deal with Simon and Schuster, uh, you know, for a, re- a reasonable advance, like 50 or 60,000, which was good. So I just set off to, you know, write it, write the diary. That's what I explained to the players that during the season, I, and I made a personal point about that because I, I liked all these guys and I had a dinner or a lunch with everybody before the season began, and which is the kind of stuff I did all the time anyway. We were all traveling together. There was no private planes. I stayed at the team hotel. Back then, anybody would ride on the team bus. So I had this tremendous intimacy. We, we would go to the airport together at 6 a.m. for the first flight out, sitting around for an hour. You had to be there an hour before your flight left all together. And so I told each player, look, I said, I'm going to write a diary kind of a season just to see what it's like. And, you know, the Bulls don't think they're going to win that season. You know, the Blazers were the favorite. They still hadn't got past the Pistons. We went into Detroit, actually, in December, and the Bulls got blown out by the Pistons early that season. So 
there's no notion as that season's gone on that this is the, you know, this is the chosen one in effect. And so I'm just figuring I'm just doing this project. I mean, I, I kind of like three months behind. I would take notes and check out things. But I, as I said, I told everyone, look, when the book comes out, there, there may be some things you don't like. It's, you know, it's, it's going to be internal basketball stuff, but nobody's going to lose their job. Nobody's going to be embarrassed with their family. In other words, look, I'm not looking to, you know, write anything. Right, right. That it's going to be off the court stuff. It's just about the interrelations of a basketball team. And it's to benefit the fans to say, look, they don't get a view of what's behind the curtain. Everyone always wants to say, hey, what are they saying to each other? Well, this is what they're saying. No big deal. It's just, it's just basketball stuff. And so I, obviously they win. But then what happened is when it came out, I think it was also the timing, not only of them winning, but that happened to be the weekend, right about the same time uh, when Jordan skips the trip to the White House, says he was going on a family vacation. You know, the whole team goes to the White House except him and and several players, Horace, and I think that's a lot of why you see some of the things with Horace and Michael come out now. Horace gets all upset. He says, well, you know, that's not right. You know, we're all going as a team. He has to go. So Horace publicly is like blasting Michael right then. Then it turns out it it wasn't, you know, a family vacation, which he had said publicly. It was a gambling weekend with a convicted drug dealer and a bail bondsman who got murdered. Who, When they discovered him, he had his Michael's check. And then Michael said it was like a loan for a golf course driving range. And then he had to go to court and testify that it wasn't. It was gambling. So all this stuff comes out at the same time. You know, on top of it, and you know, I'm, I'm sort of in the middle of that. Well, you said something I found to be fascinating, which is Michael Jordan could sell all these products, but the folks in New York didn't think he could sell a book. Yeah, you know, the publishing industry I've learned from doing several other books is not that smart. <laughs> all the glamorous stories I always heard growing up of uh, Scott Fitzgerald at the lanes and sitting around and having these intellectual discussions is not true. They're really just printers is is all they are. And they don't really have a good sense of what works. The celebrity stuff, you know, if, you know, if some walks in and a president hands them a book, they'll put it out, but they don't have a sense looking forward. So, and also as New York is very New York centric, I grew up in New York city. And so I know there is that truth, you know, where I live now is considered a flyover. And the view of the world is, if it's not in the New York papers, it hasn't happened. And so their view is, you know, you know, the Bulls are not winning anything. We're reading about the Lakers and Magic and Bird and the Celtics and the Knicks, you know, Patrick Ewing. And I remember at that time, you know, some publishers saying, well, you know, if you were writing about Patrick Ewing and the Knicks, you know, that would be something we'd be interested in. Well, they're not any good. Well, who cares about them? <laughs> you know, but they were winning 50 games. Rick Pitino had just become coach. It was like everybody always talks this thing about David Stern. You know, they want the Knicks to do well because that's David Stern's hometown, hometown paper, and he read about it. You know, and there was some element to that, although David didn't ever fall for that. Uh, but the community falls for that. And so, you know, when something happens in New York and the Knicks were sort of on the rise, Ewing's development, you know, when they made the trade for Oakley, the Knicks thought they scammed the Bulls. They were getting Oakley for Bill Cartwright, who he wasn't using, and kind of filling out this team. And the notion was, back in 89, when Jordan made the shot against Cleveland, the Knicks had a better record. You know, the Bulls upset him in that first playoff. So the New York publishing industry is thinking, the Knicks are on the way. We're going to have another boom like the early 70s when they printed about 40 books on the 70 Knicks. <laughs> you know, and so really, uh, it, despite Jordan and doing that and being on TV, the notion was that, you know, he was just another guy. You know, just he was sort of a George Gervin with a nice smile. Now, you mentioned Michael and Horace, and Horace Grant has come out and said that Michael Jordan was snitching in the documentary. He called it a so-called documentary. Um, he <laughs> said basically everybody else comes right. off in an unflattering light. Now, it's interesting, of course, to think about that with us having read the book, where Horace Grant is a fairly significant character in the book, if for no other reason than the way Phil Jackson used him as a punching bag for everybody else, right? right. I can't, can't scream at Michael right now. I'll scream at Horace. And that was part of what I thought it seemed to me maybe kind of built to where Horace is right now is the fact that so much of his role on those teams when dealing with Michael was to take abuse that other people did not have to take sometimes from him sometimes from the coach but he also was a guy who pushed back and so I guess I get his frustration with it being portrayed like nobody pushed back yeah no no it's a good point it's and it's often overlooked you know I pointed that out there was one particular instance grew up that season when we were in Philadelphia in the playoffs 
And Horace had had like had it up to finally it had enough. Phil had pushed him so far and he had this uh, meltdown. You know, they always talk about Scotty's at 1.8 seconds. But Horace in the game three in Philadelphia in that second round, you know, Phil was great at manipulating personalities and getting them all heading in the right direction, but also understanding people. And Scotty, you couldn't yell at. Scotty would retreat from that. He couldn't be dealt with that way. Horace was going to be a Marine had he not you know, got taller and become a basketball player. And that was his friendship, you know, association so close with Johnny Bach and all of the military terms and everything. So Horace could take that kind of stuff. Yeah, Phil understood and Phil recognized, you know, a drill sergeant could yell, you know, you could be a drill sergeant with Horace, you know, but at now as the playoffs were building up and, you know, we're getting uh, deeper into it and Horace just kind of had enough and cracked. And I think it was game three in Philadelphia and just started screaming at Phil on the sideline. You know, just they couldn't put him. They had to take him out of the game because, you know, they were getting beat on the boards early. And of course, Scotty's supposed to be helping. Michael's supposed to be helping. But they're leaking out, trying to get steals and leaving Horace alone, you know. And so, you know, took that abuse and he, and he was fine with it, you know, for the most part. But, you know, at some point, he and understandably, he had his Phil. Actually, Phil used that in the second three-peak. Tony Kukoc was that guy because Tony, is, as you saw, even even when guys were upset about him, he was sort of even unaware of, me, of, you know, Scotty and Michael were going after him in that 92 Olympics game. And, you know, he just thinks, hey, I'm having a bad game. <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't realize that they're picking on him to try to get a Kraus. And so, yeah, and so, you know, Horace was the one, and I think, you know, that's why Michael, his competitiveness, as you see, as we saw in the documentary, does, has not gone away. He, you know, still upset that uh, Clyde, the people thought Clyde Drexler might be better, or Carl Malone was getting a you know, MVP, you know, not to denigrate Carl, but I'm better. <laughs> you know, and so still, you know, still, and so Horace was the one in a lot of occasions where he went back at Michael, you know, because Scotty particularly was trying to be in Michael's circle a lot of the time and be embraced by Michael. And, and it, it was appealing to try to be embraced by Michael because of his celebrity and everything that went with it and the attention, you know, and Horace fought back against it a lot, you know, because, you know, Michael also identified like Bill did that this is a guy you could pick on, and, you know, can't pick on Scotty quite as much sometimes, but you could pick on this guy. And so I think, you know, we see a lot of those elements developing even now. The one thing Michael brought it up and I, I've been asked about it, Hundreds of times, and, and it amazes me, you know, media people ask me about it too. Horace was the uh, leak, you know, Horace was the snitch or something about this. And I don't talk about myself a lot because my thing is to talk about other people, and let other people make judgments. And, and I was with sort of a book about this is what it's like. And you decide whether you like it or not, whether you like them or not, whatever. You know, I'm just the conduit. That's what a media is supposed to be. Just the conduit is all these notions of media conspiracy and we're running the world. No, it's not that. It's just we're telling you what other people are saying. We're really not say, <laughs> saying very much. We're just passing it on. Obviously, it's through our portal, our view. But so I was an investigative reporter in Indiana. It won, you know, the award winning, won national awards, and people went to court. I got beaten up by somebody, assaulted as a result of stories I wrote. People lost elections. Then I go to Washington, D.C., doing investigative work. I have a background in business. My undergraduate degree is in accounting, so I have business knowledge. I go to Washington doing national investigative work, breaking stories. Then I take a little sabbatical and I work on the staff of a U.S. senator. Then I come to the Chicago Tribune. I covered the 1980 presidential campaign, doing national stuff. So now I've done all these things and I get in on sports eventually, covering these things. So now in 1988 or 89, when this 22-year-old kid from rural Georgia comes to Chicago, finally, I can get the information to write a book about the Chicago <laughs> Bulls because Horace Grant, who is, you know, has never basically been out of Georgia his whole life, has now come to Chicago, can show me the way. I mean, this is such <laughs> moronic thinking. I don't get how this keeps coming up. You know, it's just alone, the notion if you read the book, like it, people are quoted on the record. It doesn't say league sources. Bill Jackson is quoted. Michael Jordan's quoted. They're all quoted saying stuff all the time. You know, and Michael brings it up. And, and he brought it up because he doesn't like Horace. That's why he brought it up. Because Horace was the one who said, you know, hey, quit picking on guys. That was the interplay. I mean, I love that stuff. That was great stuff. You know, Horace enjoyed it too. But this notion of that none of this could have happened without Horace is so stupid. I, it just amazes me. 
Well, Horace's response surprised me just because even in the foreword of the later version of the Jordan rules, you talked about the idea that Horace Grant was the guy behind it and how silly that was. And the idea that you could write a book that was that long and that thorough and that there'd just be one person that's telling anything. But I was a little surprised that Horace heard that and then went off the way he did on the basis of it because he's been hearing it for 30 years. And I also thought the documentary presented it where Michael said that and then Horace says, no, that's not the case. Like, it wasn't as though Michael's word was bond. Yeah, but you know, when Michael says something, people go, well, yeah, Michael said that, you know. And especially there's a, there's a lot of <laughs> right. media sycophants with Michael, too, who are still trying. There's always been, you know, people in the media a lot trying to. And that's what happened a lot when the Jordan rules came out. You know, I had a lot of media turn on me because, like, who do you want to be friends with, me or Michael Jordan? Who's going to help your career more <laughs> if Michael Jordan likes you versus, you know, it's not a matter of like or dislike, but you, it was a lot of media of, and, and, and you know, in Chicago, I, it was a lot, it was incredible scenes. You know, the, the TV would do like uh, things walking, you know, like where they walk outside and reporting, like in the rain, you know, holding an umbrella, like you wouldn't know it's raining. And they did a walking thing and somebody kicked the Jordan rules down a sewer. <laughs> this guy was on a thing and said, we, I should burn this book. So there's all this hysteria growing about this product. And so, you know, when Michael says stuff, whether it's true or not, and, you know, a, a lot of the documentary, it was great. I think it was terrific. I enjoyed it. You know, but a lot of it was based on a true story. You know, it wasn't ex- a lot of the stuff he said wasn't exactly what happened. But, you know, if Michael says it, he's got a lot of authority with a lot of people and understandably so. You know, they're buying his shoes. They're putting all his stuff on his body. People are walking around dressed in Jordan. Horace's reaction probably is because Michael in the show directly said, well, yeah, Horace, you know, he's the bad guy. <laughs> so, you know, I think he's probably like me. He's like, geez, God, we have, we got to keep hearing this 30 years later. Right. And I guess another element also with the book, and the book, and this, of course, comes up in the documentary again, is the role that Jerry Krause played with this team. And it never felt like a wake for Michael with Jerry Krause. It never, ever did. And I find it almost kind of amazing because every idea that Michael Jordan ever had for you wanted the Bulls to do was yeah. a horrible one. And all the Krause ones worked. No, you're right. And, and, and you're right. Because he, he actually, and, and I was saying before, he, he had grown so frustrated about trying to compete, you know, at the highest level. Because, you know, he really was, you know, was a, a winning kind of guy and had a winning ability. And, you know, they basically say in the narrative in that era is you can't win. You know, you don't make players better. You know, that old saw and magic and bird and whatever. And so, you know, he wants to get rid of Horace and Scotty, you know, by 89 and 90, a year, a year or two in. You know, Scotty with the migraine headache and, and, and in the 89 playoffs went out in the first minute in game six against Detroit. You know, Lambie hit him in the head. He got a concussion. So, you know, Michael's seeing this around him that, you know, Kevin McHale's out there for 46 minutes and my guys are, you know, leaving with headaches. <laughs> and so people ask me with the crowd thing, was it fair? And, you know, fair is fair is whatever. Fair is personal view. It was accurate. You know, you know, the Jerry was really difficult to deal with. And Steve Carr, I said, think said early in the documentary, you know, Jerry couldn't get out of his own way. It really mean, he, he brought this on himself constantly. And you saw even like the little clip when they were coming back from the winning in Detroit and they were all celebrating. And, you know, Jerry's trying to get in the middle of it, dancing down the aisle. It's like, you know, that old Kennedy quote about, you know, victory having a thousand fathers and defeats an orphan. Yeah, defeats an orphan. And, and that's the <laughs> idea, you know. Jerry kept trying to get in the way and say, hey, don't forget about giving me credit. And you get the credit by what you put in place succeeding. And Jerry did, was getting plenty of credit. He was executive of the year twice, but there were so many other psychological factors there about, you know, wanting to be one of the guys, you know, obviously growing up, you could see he probably wasn't. And, you know, then you get into a contest with this guy with the sharpest wit and the quickest verbal attacks in the league, you know, maybe the best potential trash talker because we could back it up, you know, and so Jerry was at such a disadvantage and just kept throwing himself right, you know, right in the middle of the, you know, right in the target. He just never got it. He just never understood that what he was doing was right. But that that's what Jerry Reinsdorf, you know, he gets criticized too. They said, well, why didn't you, you know, get Krauss to do this or say that? Well, you know, he said Krauss is doing the right thing. Thing. He's making the right picks. You know, he's been making the right moves. All right. So he's not the most appealing person, but he, we're succeeding by what the personnel things he's doing. So why should I replace him? I mean, who am I going to put in his place? Michael Jordan, you know? <laughs> so, so yeah, right. you know, so it, it, you know, it may not come off looking as well, uh, aesthetically appealing, but it was having success. 
Do you think the book contributed to whatever happened to the relationship between Krause and Phil Jackson? Uh, yes and no. Jerry was hard to get along with under any circumstances. Phil, he, he really, at the, by the, toward the end, you know, he, he, he it was alienated from uh, Tim Floyd, who he had you know, brought in and courted for years. He was uh, alienated from everyone. Al Vermeil, who he talked about, you know, so lovingly about his one of the first uh, weight training guys. He alienated from him. It was just impossible to have a long term relationship with Jerry Krause. And so Jerry never forgave Phil for not appreciating him enough because he saved them. And Phil did. Phil, after the Jordan rules came out, you know, Jerry was, understandably, I felt badly in some respects, but that was the story. You know, I could not tell the story that it was. And, 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 you know, and Phil used some of it. You know, Phil's thing always was, what could I do to put this team in the best position to win? And one of the ways was, you know, how do I bond the group? That's the theme in the book and the theme in whatever Phil's done. How do I, you know, in the imagery does, uh, the Kipling poems, uh, the Native American stuff. You know, it's all about bonding the group. You know, Phil recognized there were issues with management, with Krauss or whatever. So he used that, you know, and he took advantage of it a lot. And so he would point out, you know, hey, when the book came out, he used me, too. He said, you know, that book shows that people you can trust are us or me, you know, that the media is out to get you and the management's not supportive. And, and, and so maybe it wasn't unifying the whole, but Phil's methods proved, you know, successful. And that's the way we judge. And he said he felt this was the best way. Documentary has shown wonderfully, too. I thought it was in the book, too. And especially in later on with Rodman, this was an unusual group of people to keep going in the same direction. Obviously, Michael's personality, what it was, but Scotty, the way he is, Horace, you know, and some of the others. And then later. And so they always said, well, Phil just rolls out the ball. He's got great players. I, I think, no, I felt Jordan rules demonstrated that as well. That was a part. You know, if anybody to me. I thought Phil was the main character in the Jordan rules in great part. Obviously, Jordan, because of who he was. But Phil did so many of the things he was doing. Like, to me, one of the best things I loved about it was that speech he gave. I remember when the first Gulf War broke out. That was that season in the book. We were in Atlanta, and there was a lot of fear in the country. And that was the first time, you know, that was before 9-11, obviously, the first time the airports were under siege like that, and we were being checked. And Phil had gathered the players together. Okay, so we're winning the war. And now you're probably too young to remember. But it gets to the point uh, that the U.S. troops are on the verge of Baghdad. They're outside. And a lot of U.S. debate is, should we go into Baghdad, get Sadat then? And George Bush won. He was the only smart Bush among the presidents. He says no. You know, and, and it, was, it was much criticized. And I think it helped lead to his defeat to Clinton. But Phil then has a meeting with the team. And he brings this up. You know, and it was an example. I mean, how, how much of that kind of stuff? But that was Phil, you know, always trying to get the connection with the group. And so he says, OK, who wants who thinks we should go into Iraq? And and of course, all the young guys, the aggressive young guys, Jordan and Pippen and Grant are all, yeah, let's get in there. Let's kick their butts. Let's kill. You know, and Phil saying, you know what? There's consequences when you do things like that. What about the children of these people? How are they going to react seeing Americans come in and do that? And I thought that was an incredibly prescient thing. I wish Bill Bradley would have uh, won uh, the presidency and Phil would have been secretary of state in some respects. But scenes like that, which was so unique, I mean, those are the scenes that I loved, you know, being around that team and was able to write in the book. And I thought, you know, those methods with Phil and his communication with the team, and, you know, and some of those he used Jerry Krause a, a, as, a, you know, sort of a hey, you know, this guy is, is trying to keep us from our goal. So it wasn't personal with Phil. It was whatever he needed to use to get to the team, to get to its final result, which was winning a title. So you say, well, is it, is it worth it having alienating your boss? Well, your boss asked you, do what you could to put this team in position to succeed. And, and I think that's what Phil was doing all along. Eventually, Jerry was going to be estranged from Phil as he was estranged from everybody else because he was estranged from everybody else.
Vinny Goodwill made an interesting point when he was reading through the book as he has covered a lot of bad teams. And in the course of that, he said he's reading the Jordan rules and he was like, wow. So this stuff happens on all teams, not just the bad ones. Like the stuff like Cliff Levingston trying to get the money as quickly as he can because he owes the other people money <laughs> and things that people are saying about their roles and everything else. Is that like for him, he was just like, oh, so this is just what an NBA team is like. Right. And that's a great point. Another other you have Detroit guys. But, but yeah, yeah, I, I could have written that book and that was the idea. See, that's the th- thought the book I was going to have, sort of like David Halberstam's Breaks of the Game. It was just going to be fun, inside look at another team. You know, the Bulls weren't a favorite that year in 1991. Most everybody didn't think they could get by Detroit, including in, in the Chicago media. And back then in the NBA, the notion was you had to go to the finals and lose. So you learned what it was, and then you could win, uh, like Boston did with LA, Detroit with LA. Portland had lost to Detroit, and now it's their turn. And, and they end up starting that season 19-1. and one. So the notion, you know, the, the Bulls really is maybe our time's coming in the next couple of years. You know, we, if we get back to Detroit, and obviously Portland's going to win this year. So, And Michael even said it, how much meeting Detroit meant uh, to them. And even more than that, it, it, it you know, because – they weren't really even talking about titles that year. You know, I thought I just had a book about a team going through a season. I didn't think I had a championship team with Michael Jordan enhancing and, you know, growing to the role he did in society that just transcended, you know, his marketing. That All of a sudden I had a team that was on the verge of a dynasty. It never occurred to me. And, and, and that's why also, like we'd said before, I was so surprised at the reaction to it because I didn't see any of this coming. I thought, oh, well, they, they won. Wow. Even when we, get, we got to the finals, I would say 90 percent of the media picked the Lakers to win. You know, here's the Bulls, you know, first time in the finals. You know, what chance do they have? You know, we got the veteran magic, James Worthy, Sam Perkins, all these hardened veterans. They know what it takes. They come into Chicago, win the first game. <laughs> so everybody's written the bulls off, basically. And, of course, I, they win. They go out, you know, do the spectacular things. But everything's coming kind of as a surprise. <laughs> and it was just supposed to be another story of another team. All right. That is Sam Smith. You check him out now. ChicagoBulls.com is the author of the Jordan rules. I thank you so much for joining us here. The book club has been a lot of fun for us. So I thank you for the book and for the time. Well, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to get through it and give some perspective. And and I really appreciate it. All right. No problem. And ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us here on the right time. We do this thing a couple times a week. My man, Gabe Bassane handles everything behind the scenes. Thank you, sir. Uh, Remember, subscribe to the right time. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm to think you are a hater and we'll talk to you guys in a couple of days take it easy thanks for checking out the right time with bomani jones podcast you can listen or subscribe on the espn app apple podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts the right time with bomani jones